But thank, thanks a lot uh, for having me here. Thanks to the organizers for organizing this nice workshop. Um, I'm sorry, my, my throat's terrible today, and I'm going to be croaking my way through this talk. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to, to talk about uh, this experiment that, that, that we did. Uh, it was published a few months ago. That's really, I think, the culmination of uh, about six to seven years of, 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 of progress in a set of techniques referred to as, as error mitigation. Um, and, and them going quite um, hand in hand with our, our hardware progress, you know, how, how, how quickly um, superconducting quantum hardware has, has, has really progressed. So, so before I start, I really have to, to acknowledge, uh, you know, the people who did the work. Uh, Young Sir Kim and Andrew Eddins on my team, who really did the, you know, the heavy lifting. Uh, and, and of course, this is, this is really something that, uh, that, that we've been pushing along for several years now with Kristen, Sergey, and Jay Gambetta on these techniques of error mitigation. Um, for this project, uh, you know, we had the, the great pleasure of collaborating with, um, with my exact, the Zalatels group at, at UC Berkeley, uh, you know, uh, collaborating with them on, um, on, on, on classical simulations of our experiment. But as I said, you know, this, was, this was really, as, I think it'll be very apparent as I, as I go through the talk, this is, this is really only possible because of the incredible amount of progress that, that, that really went behind building these devices and deploying them and maintaining them and, and so on. And for that, I really have to you know, address, you know, acknowledge the entire IBM quantum team. OK, uh, cool. Yeah, so, so some of you might have, um, might have you know, caught this paper a bit uh, you know, when it came out, some of the, 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 the social media commentary. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll begin with addressing the elephant in the room for, you know, for a few minutes, and then we'll get into the the science, okay? Um, so um, <clears throat> the the title of the paper was was evidence for the utility of quantum computing before fault tolerance. You know, one can imagine with a title like this, there's obviously going to be a lot of deliberation internally with our collaborators as well. Uh, and this is something you know, you know, we felt quite comfortable about. Um, and and I think in in light of more recent simulations, I'd argue this is even stronger evidence. So so maybe it'll be useful to to parse through what we were trying to say, <clears throat> right? So this, this is evidence. So, so why evidence? Because I don't think this is an open or, or shut case. This is, this is initial experimental evidence that um, there is utility. There's the, the, the quality of being useful for, for quantum computers today before fault tolerance to be, you know, to be, to be useful computational tools, okay? And, 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 and what, was the, what was the extent of that claim? Okay, what are we trying to, or why are we making that, that claim? Basically, we're arguing that we have experiments on 127 qubits, and even in the absence of fault tolerance, we're running circuits, non-trivial circuits on these 127 qubits, and we're able to show that one can measure expectation values that are, are, that are, that are accurate um, at circuit volumes that are you know, at a scale well beyond what one can do with brute force classical methods. Okay? That's it. That's, that, that's the extent of the claim. And, and, and you know, I'll, 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 I'll talk through a, you know, a, a lot of this during my talk, um, but, but you know, of course, there were there were different interpretations for what this what this paper meant, uh, and, and I, I do want to clarify that this is absolutely not you know a quantum advantage claim. There there seems to be this this uh, this tendency to to try and pack or assume that this kind of large experiment you know is trying to make an advantage or supremacy claim. That's absolutely not the case. All we're trying to say is that we can run circuits that are at a scale beyond brute force classical computation. By brute force, I mean exact exact diagonalization. You know. And, and this is, and, and yet, without fault tolerance, you're able to report accurate expectation values, okay? Um, so while I'm, I'm, I'm clarifying on, on what this paper is not about, you know, it's also like, important to state that we're not, we're not claiming that, that you know, the, the traditional algorithms that, 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 you know, that have motivated a lot of the progress in our field uh, can be done with, without fault tolerance. Um, and, and, and the example I'll be, <clears throat> I'll, I'll be talking through is, uh, you know, a simulation of an icing model, and, and certainly the utility does not lie in, in that specific simulation. You know, somehow how it's how it's more um, uh, you know applicable than, than random circuits or something. No, it, the, the 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 spirit of this is that trying to run a, a short depth quantum circuit with the depth is is defined by you know the, the 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 coherence budget that one has. You know, very much like you know the kind of work we we heard about in the previous talk. Uh, trying to run a short depth quantum circuit. Measurement of expectation values after that really is the core primitive of, of what people are trying to do in the near term with existing noisy devices, right? And then the ability 
to run such circuits and measure accurate expectation values is what we're really after at this point. Okay, so um, so getting into the more more technical aspects now. Uh, this is this is the the hardware architecture that we have. Uh, this is really the building block uh, of a two qubit example. Um, uh, here is one transmon qubit. Here is another. One typically has some some fixed coupling mediated by a coplanar waveguide resonator, and then you know qubits typically have their own um, uh, uh, drive lines and, and and can be can be measured individually, and uh, so this is this is really a very simple two qubit example, um, but but this kind of uh, you know uh, bare bones example is what has led to to really scaling up this architecture now to even you know over over 400 qubits, okay, um, and the example the, the experiments I'll be talking about today are on on this Eagle device with 127 qubits, um, uh, but al already at, you know perhaps beyond the 65 qubit scale. One could argue that, that this is already a scale that's beyond what one can do with brute force. Okay, um, even though we're building these large lattices, uh, you know, definitely towards the, the the idea of trying to test out uh, examples of error correction, this is not quite at the scale that one has a fully fault tolerant architecture yet. Right. So, so what can one do with these systems in the absence of fault tolerance when we're at these scales beyond you know, exact classical simulation? Uh, this is a question that, that, that you know a, a bunch of us are very motivated to ask. You know, I myself for sure, um, and, and it's it's what it's what probing this you know and and and, and pushing along this this direction. Um, so um, maybe to build some intuition, then uh, let's take a simple example. You know, maybe assume that we had about a hundred qubits in our circuit, and and perhaps we had about ten thousand two qubit gates. Okay. Um, about the state of the art for superconducting, uh, you know, qubit technology, two qubit gates are at, you know, about at the 99.9% percent uh, fidelity. So, if one wanted to do a simple estimation of what that expected state fidelity would be at the end of that circuit, that's going to be an incredibly lousy number, right? Uh, so, is there is there really anything one can then do uh, when these when these fidelities are so poor, right? Um, um, you know. Trying to preserve the quantum that state is basically the game of error correction. Uh, but then one could ask, well, is is trying to estimate certain properties of that state uh, a little more accessible problem with what we have in the near term? Okay, um, and to maybe let's just push along this this example. And this is this is a very simplistic example, and but but it it it, it helps for experimentalists like myself. Um, is is assume that you had this 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 chain of about a thousand spins, and you flipped one of them, right? Um, uh, then you basically have a fidelity of zero. Uh, the overlap between those two states is, is zero. But if you instead ask the question, well, what was the global magnetization, right? That has only changed in the in the third digit. So this gives you a sense that there might be certain quantities that are not, you know, quite as sensitive to noise or to errors like this. You know, fidelity perhaps is somewhat, you know, maybe a worst case metric. But there might be other quantities that might be within reach. Right. I mean, of course. Uh, you know, if I if I specifically ask the question, what is the magnetization of that particular spin? That's going to be entirely wrong as well. But there might be certain quantities which 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 might not be terrible, right? So quantities like this, you know, trying to measure um, the global magnetization of, of an interacting spin system, for instance. Um, you know, are, are these are these examples of interesting things? You know, we heard a lot in the in the previous talk. Uh, you know, about uh, you know, for instance, measuring energies of of, of molecules. Uh, you know, correlation functions, uh, kernels in machine learning, all of these are really examples of, 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 of measuring expectation values uh, and, and, and measuring these after running a short depth quantum circuit. Uh, a lot of the, the near term algorithms, you know, have been looking at, at, at topics like this, right? So, so trying to do this could be an interesting endeavor, right? And this is something we, 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 we got started with uh, in 2017. Uh, this was really just a four qubit circuit with, with a circuit depth of two. Uh, what I mean by that are, are basically two blocks of parallelized entangling gates. And we were really trying to ask you know, this very simple question, you know, how, how, how well does a quantum computer try you know, produce the, the energies of a very simplistic molecule, lithium hydride, that's been, you know, the problem's been reduced to one on four qubits. And, and, and this was the ideal. Uh, <clears throat> ideal trace, and then those were the 
the, the expectation values that we measured of the, of the quantum hardware, right? And then we, we, we saw these, these examples on, on, on Sophia's slides of, of chemical accuracy, and this is, this is orders of magnitude off, okay? No, 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 no quantum chemist is gonna be interested by these kinds of inaccuracies. So the question then was, well, is there, is there a way around this? And essentially, um, you know, there, was, there was work from Kristen, Sergey, and Jay basically proposing uh, a, a bunch of techniques called error mitigation, um, which, which basically uh, shows that even with an existing noisy quantum computer, um, you can have access to noise-free expectation values. Okay? Um, and, and there was also simultaneous work from, from Simon Benjamin's group um, at Oxford. <clears throat> right, so, so, what's the, so what's the idea here? Um, so there were a couple of techniques that were, <clears throat> uh, that were presented in that, uh, in that paper. Uh, I'm going to be focusing for the large part of my talk on just one of these. This is called zero noise extrapolation. And the idea here is basically that you can express your, your expectation value of interest in terms of some noise parameter. Okay? And the, the, the goal is, so you have a Taylor series like this, and the goal is to try and um, access this, this zero noise estimate. Um, and, and the question is, how can you do that? Um, you know, as an experimentalist, perhaps I had some ability to, to very controllably you know, tune the noise, perhaps amplify it by a factor of C here, and remeasure that expectation value. And now one can see that with these two estimations, um, you can now construct an estimate where you've suppressed the leading order noise term to the, to the second order in the noise, right? And this is basically a game that you can continue if you had additional noisy measurements. This is basically Richardson extrapolation. And you can, you know, with, with n measurements, you can, in principle, arbitrarily suppress the, the leading order noise term to the lambda to the n. Okay? Um, the question, though, of course, is, is, is how does one actually measure uh, this amplified noise uh, uh, expectation value, right? Um, <clears throat> so one, 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 one trick that we, we did in the initial papers um, was to, to rerun the circuits with, with recalibrated gates. So for instance, if one had a 100 nanosecond two qubit gate, you would recalibrate it you know, to, to be a 200 nanosecond gate. Um, and under certain assumptions, um, trying to remeasure the expectation values after that, that longer circuit, you know, here scaling the two qubit gates from 100 to 200 nanoseconds would have been equivalent to amplifying the noise by a factor of two. Okay? And I'll emphasize this is under certain assumptions. Okay? But this was what we, we tried. Um, and then you know, a couple of years later after this, this initial experiment, um, um, basically we, we, we re-ran the same computation now with this kind of zero noise extrapolation. And you can see here that um, these, these, uh, uh, these are the, the expectation values at, 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 at the amplified noise levels, factors of 1.1, 1.25, 1.5. And even though <clears throat> these raw values are, are heavily offset from the ideal, you can use these to reconstruct what the, what the expectation value would have been in the absence of noise. And you have much better um, agreement with the ideal trace. Okay? Um, this was, of course, just <coughs> uh, a four qubit experiment. Um, but the natural question was, well, well how does this actually um, scale up to, to um, oops, um, scale up to a larger scale? Um, um, and then basically, if, if you try and look at the bounds that one has, uh, <coughs> it's basically going to be uh, you know, a function of the number of qubits, your noise parameter, and then the total circuit evolution time. And, and, and this is basically the remainder in your Taylor series. And as this blows up, then the extrapolations will be, you know, will, 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 will be um, uncontrolled. So if you naively look at this, what this is telling you is that as you want to increase the circuit volume, that's n times t, you perhaps also need to you know, su suppress the, the noise in the device by uh, 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 a similar factor. Uh, and that's, that's quite challenging. Okay? Um, and hardware has made progress, but not that not quite that much. Uh, so so, so this, this, this follow-up work was basically trying to ask the question, um, um, is, this, is this bound really representative, or is this a loose bound, and so on. And, and basically, the, the, the conclusion from this was there could be you know, quantities that, that, that perform better than these bounds, and, and it's, it's worth pursuing what those quantities could be. OK? Yeah. Just a few Yeah, please. So here, it looks like 
it's not the, the mitigated value and the, the arbitrary C does not scale linearly. Um, yeah, so, so, so um, actually, it's pretty close to linear because it's actually. Um, the gap is very large between yeah. 0 and 1 compared to 1 to 2. Uh, between zero and one. Ah, okay, fine. Right. Yes, that, 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 that's, that's, that's a good that's a good observation. Uh, there is no reason for it to scale linearly. We I mean, so but by by doing a linear extrapolation, all I'm assuming is that I'm going to get a better estimate, where the leading order noise term is going to be second order. Right. But but th th there is yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm showing this this Taylor series. Right. There's no there's no reason to expect it to be linear. Depending on the order of the extrapolation, in principle, you can suppress increasingly higher order noise terms. But, but yeah, there, there is no, there's, no, there's no reason to expect this to be only linear. Right? Um, the, the reason I was a little <coughs> hesitant is, um, is, at least in the, in the 1 to 1.5 regime, there, there it, 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 looks, it looks quite good. It lo looks pretty linear, like the, the 1.25 point you know, falls kind of between the 1 and 1.5. But, but, but still, that, that's not relevant too much. Yeah. So, so in your, as you said, Taylor expansion, uh, yeah. sometimes people think about, okay, does it pay off to look, to involve higher order ter terms? Yeah. So from your um, experience, if you would consider, for example, second order terms, will the benefit of the accuracy will be worth in terms of the complexity which uh, which this will take to get a better approximation? There is always a trade off, right? Yeah, um, and that's a great question. So, in fact, actually, even in even in this work, th there was some example of of, um, um, of of extrapolations going up to third order that that worked really beautifully. Um, so, so I, I did I did speak to you know the, the the sampling cost associated with trying to to do higher order extrapolations, but the other thing which is which is, I think is more critical is you try and go to higher order extrapolations, you become increasingly sensitive. To how accurately you're amplifying the noise, and that's where a lot of things break down. Where you know, if, if like you might have slight inaccuracies in, in, in how you're amplifying the noise, and then as you try and extrapolate, you know, things can go heavily unphysical, right? And that's where the challenge is. And, and I'll, I'll address how, um, with some of the more recent advances in how you amplify the noise, extrapolations seem to be a lot better behaved than, than what we were doing with just naive pulse stretch. Yeah, please. Uh, this bound you had, I think, on the next slide. Yes. Yeah. Is that a rigorous bound? This is this is basically the the, the remainder in the Taylor expansion, right? Right. But but the question is, is this really representative? And there's evidence that that's it's not necessarily the case in general. They, they can be. There there are examples that we discussed in this work where things behave better than than that bound. So it's a loose upper bound. Let's say. Okay. <clears throat> cool. So. Um, uh, these are examples of you know where the landscape of error mitigation experiments is you know from from our group uh, and and perhaps you might have heard that, that, that we want to get into this this hundred by hundred land hundred qubits with a circuit depth of hundred um, and, and and the experiment I'll be talking about today is basically one with one hundred and twenty seven qubits going up to a circuit depth of sixty okay um, so what really made that experiment possible right for one of course it's it's the hardware, building a system at the scale, all the supporting infrastructure, uh, you know, and there's been you know, very steady progress along this. Uh, so this, of course, is, is one very big, one big part of it. But, but scale is not sufficient. You also need quality, right? Ultimately, the number of gates that you can fit into the, the circuit, the, the, the depth you can go up to, all of this is going to be connected to your error rates, your coherence times. Um, so, so this was... Uh, the, the, the first uh, version of the, the Eagle device that we had, um, and then you know, uh, we, we really had you know, pretty amazing coherence improvements, you know, scaling the median <coughs> T1s by a factor of two to three uh, for, for the R3 device, which was the one we used in the experiment. That was very important. Um, this is the typical connectivity that we have. Um, um, there, there were also advances that, that the team came up with you know, towards improving the device calibration. Um, trying to, to calibrate you know, a device at the scale, as you can imagine, is a fairly non-trivial task, particularly for the kind of circuits that I'll be discussing, these, these trotterized time evolution circuits. Um, one's looking at, at, uh, at parallelized layers of two qubit gates. So instead of trying to optimize the individual gate performance, one can ask the question, 
you know, what, what can I do to try and improve the, the layer performance? And that was really the, the, the guiding you know, uh, principle behind how we tried to calibrate this device. Um, and, and even here, this, this, this did involve trying to make a lot of the gates slower, but, but despite that, with the improved coherence, you know, we had an overall improvement in gate fidelities. Okay. Um, Question. Yeah. Um, I'm puzzled by the fact that you can make your noise small. What if your maze noise lo remains large? Can oh. you not do in principle? I mean, if you have a polynomial and you know the values in 15, and the polynomial doesn't have a large degree, yeah. I can in principle calculate the value at zero, even if I use values which are large. Yeah. So that, that, that's a great question. So so. And, and maybe we can, we can get into a little bit of this, but as you can already imagine, there is some additional cost that you're paying. Yes, right? that's without yes. a doubt. Yes, I agree. And, and, and so, so the question is going to be then, how much does that scale with your, with your noise rates? Okay? And that, that essentially is the, the crux of this game of error mitigation. Uh, there is an exponential scaling to sampling cost, but then as you drive the error rates down, that cost becomes manageable, even though it's an exponential scaling. Okay, that's that's the essence. But thanks, thanks for that question. <clears throat> okay, so um, then the third really important ingredient here was, of course, how do you how do you amplify the noise? You know, can you can you improve this this noise manipulation? Um, and are there any more questions um, at this point before I dive into the next part? <clears throat> yeah, please. Uh, why is why is the effect on uh, the improvement in error so much less than the improvement in T1? Ah, um, because the, the gates were also slowed down. So the, the um, so, okay, so, so, so the, the first thing I should say is that our two qubit gates are not quite coherence limited. And what I mean by that is the coherence time is not, not, not the only limit on, on two qubit gate fidelity. Um, <clears throat> um, and, and maybe I can, I can just say a bit about the, 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 the coloring that, that we have here is uh, all the red links are, 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 are operated in parallel, all the green links are operated in parallel, and all the, the, the blue links as well. <clears throat> so the way this, this optimization was done was we only chose the slowest gate in every layer. We really optimized that one, and then we set all the other layers, all the other links to have the same gate time. So even though the coherence is improved, the actual gate times were also much slower, right? And despite that, you still have an improvement in, in, in gate fidelity. Okay. <clears throat> cool. <coughs> okay. So, um, I'm going to talk through this very simplistic one qubit example, right? Where we have some noisy unitary. This is the expectation value we want to measure. This is going to be the expectation value we measure at, at the base noise rate. Um, um, and, and now we want to we want to amplify the noise by some controllable in some controllable fashion, right? Um, you know, maybe I can I can model that noisy unitary as, as some noise channel acting upon acting upon the ideal gate. And if I wanted to amplify the noise by a factor of two, you know, this could be modeled as, as trying to insert an additional noise channel, right? So how does one actually then implement this in practice? Um, for the purpose of this discussion, um, let me assume that I actually had knowledge of this noise channel. Uh, it was a, a simple poly noise channel um, that, that I've characterized, so I have access to what these, these bit flip uh, error rates are, P, okay? Um, and by linearity, what one can then see is if you had access to this noise channel, trying to access this amplified noise expectation value, the expectation value amplified by a factor of two, really amounts to probabilistically sampling between these two circuits with probabilities associated with these, these learned values p. Okay? And I, 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 I took a very simplistic example where I was amplifying the noise by a factor of two, um, where I, I just had a simple bit flip channel. Uh, but in principle, you know, one could have a more complicated poly channel, one could have arbitrary noise amplification factors, and this game works. But this is really the spirit of, of, of how this <clears throat> how we're going to be doing the, the error amplification, okay, probabilistically. Um, um, now, I, I gave you this very simple <clears throat> one qubit example, but then in, in principle, we're trying to run these, these multi qubit circuits, where one is going to have crosstalk errors, decoherence, correlated errors, control errors, you know, a, a lot of 
things going on simultaneously and trying to, to have a representative noise model for this is you know, an exponentially challenging problem. It, it's going to require you to characterize 4 to the n by 4 to the n terms, okay? uh, which, is, which is once again a very challenging task. Um, and, and once again, you can try and model this as some noise channel of, you know, followed by the ideal gate for every, for every, for every layer. Um, um, and and, and the, the, the first simplification we're going to do is basically do what's called poly twirling. So basically that, that involves trying to randomly insert uh, poly gates before every noisy layer and then undoing them so that the layer is logically equivalent and then averaging over many randomizations. So then uh, the noise channel becomes diagonal in the poly basis. So this is, this is one simplification. You still have an exponential number of terms to learn, 4 to the n minus 1. But this is an important simplification to, to, to make the noise uh, into a poly channel on average. Okay? Um, but really to make progress then, one, one still has to make, has to take this exponentially uh, you know, scaling problem and, and, and reduce the complexity to something polynomial. Okay? And for this one has to make assumptions on the nature of the noise in the device. Um, and, and basically for that, uh, we're going to you know, look at this, this sparse poly Lumblad model, which was introduced in this work. Uh, the first author here, Ewald, will be talking you know, in, in much more detail about uh, this model on Thursday. So, so you know, uh, please, please tune into that as well. But essentially, <clears throat> we have to make certain sparsity assumptions. Uh, the, the composite noise model, basically, we're going to, we're going to uh, represent as a product of, of simpler polymaps. But then the poly terms we consider in this product, they're only going to have support on the individual qubits and then, and then two qubit generators you know, for, for links of qubits on the device. Okay? Um, and, and basically, uh, you know, for this kind of heavy hex architecture, this is going to reduce the number of uh, model parameters that you need to learn to something that's only you know, linear in the number of qubits. Okay? Uh, so basically what this game is going to then amount to is trying to to learn these, these WIs, and then once you have those, you can essentially amplify the noise very much like that one qubit example. Okay? So how does one actually learn <coughs> poly noise? Uh, you know, there have been several discussions in the literature. You know, the typical game is to, to try and have several repetitions of the noise channel and then look at, uh, look at decades in the fidelity uh, you know, with circuit depth. And this basically is going to get you access to these, you know, the, those DKs are going to get you access to these fidelities uh, in, in a, in a spam-free way. Uh, the challenge, though, is, is going to be that um, <clears throat> in an arbitrary circuit, you can't quite separate the noise channel from the gate. Okay? Um, and, and for that, what one then does is, uh, is to try and run identity-equivalent blocks repeated times. So for instance, you know, even multiples of C0 gates uh, you know, try and uh, run them multiple times, and then some of these fidelities get mixed, and then you know, instead of getting access to the individual fidelities, you have access to products of fidelities. Uh, but all of this can be done. The number of terms, you have, the number of fidelities you have to learn, you know, is also a, a smaller number because the number of noise parameters is is now you know a, a more manageable problem. Uh, and all of this can be done. And Evout will talk uh, a lot more in detail, you know, of, of of how all of this procedure works on Thursday. But the essence is, <clears throat> by trying to reduce this model complexity, we can characterize the noise model on average, okay, not on a shot-by-shot -shot basis, on average, for a 127 qubit device. Right? Um, and as I was saying, you know, all of these different blocks represent the model parameters. You have three per qubit, and then nine for every link uh, in the device. Um, and, and basically, you've, you've, you've reduced the model complexity from something with 10 to the 76 parameters to you know, uh, in something close to a couple thousand. That's, that's more manageable. Right? And then one can ask, of course, okay, you've, you've done this elaborate procedure to characterize the noise. Is it really <clears throat> representative? Right? And then some sanity checks can be done. I'll be talking a little more about uh, some practical challenges with superconducting qubits towards the end of my talk. One is you know, interactions of these qubits with what are known as de facto two-level systems that typically you know, lead to you know, severe drops in coherence times. And you can see basically those qubits pop up uh, you know, in, in examples like this in this tomogram. Um, there are more complex examples of how we can build some confidence into the noise model that I'll discuss. Um, but this is, this is basically the, the, the game here. <clears throat> uh, 
And, and as, I, as I showed for the one qubit example, once you have access to these, uh, uh, these model parameters, you're then going to sample through different poly operators based on your knowledge of that noise model. Very much like that, that, that initial one qubit example, right? So, so we have all the machinery in place. We have the device. We have the good coherence and gate fidelities to access reasonable depths. We have a way of improving our control of the noise. No, so let's let's see. Yeah, please. Sorry, I'm I'm still puzzled by your complexity reduction. Uh -huh. um, so you have these random weights in front of your Paulis, mm -hmm. and then you prove theoretically that there are some some kind of concentration which allows you to use fewer parameters, and you calculate them before you implement the algorithm or during the. Yeah. So so we don't prove it theoretically. <clears throat> we make an assumption based on our knowledge of the device. So, so we, don't, we don't quite expect, in, in, in a device like this, we don't quite expect correlated noise between very distant qubits, for instance. We think the dominant, the, the, the dominant noise is more, more local. And this is an assumption that we have to make to reduce this. And then, we're essentially, you can, you can view this as we're testing those assumptions in one sense. So, so it, isn't, it isn't a proof, per se. You can, but, but you have to make certain assumptions to reduce this complexity from. <clears throat> So essentially, you're, you're only twisting a few of these models. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have this model also, and as you said, you're assuming that there's no correlation between the distant blocks, but you also have like locally the blocks that may look very similar and they are placed in different parts of your big. Uh -huh. Are you assuming that if there is a one block which repeats in your kind of whole grid, this block will be modeled just once the same way in independent where it shows up? Uh, we're not. We're not doing that. Okay. And, and this, is, <coughs> this is one aspect of superconducting qubits, that not all qubits are equal. Uh, they're, they're very different across the device. So, so, so that's, that's, that's a hard assumption to typically make. Yeah, so could you remind us how did you uh, justify the reducer model or do the benchmarking for this model? Uh, how, how did we... How did we uh, just justify this noise model is accurate? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll show you some more examples later on. But, but in principle, one can, one can say that the error mitigation experiment itself is one benchmark of you know, like how, how, how representative the noise model is. But I'll, I'll, I'll show you some examples very soon. The, the, the one very loose you know, sanity check sort of example I gave was if we see qubits with, you know, with terrible T1 times, we do see that you know, the model parameters are also large. We see those decays in the learning to be very quick. Things like that. So, so there are some sanity checks, but it's a it's a great question, and I think it's it's something that'll that'll be a continued line of research. Benchmarking these kinds of of noise models will be very important as we try and improve bounds on, or try and improve our error analysis of, of the kind of expectation values we're getting. But can, how long does it take you to learn these sixteen hundred parameters, and, and how stable are they? Yeah, that's another great question. <laughs> uh, it's pretty quick. Uh, I'd say order of an hour. But a lot of that is is dominated by by classical overheads that you know just, just the the overhead with with trying to load pulses on our AWGs and compiling the circuits and so on. There's a lot of room to to make that much faster. The nice thing with this is it doesn't quite scale, uh, you know, with the number of qubits. So so the kind the amount of time it took us to learn a 10 qubit noise model is about the same as it took for a 100 qubit. Uh, so. Uh, the stability is a very, very important question, and I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, uh, I, I alluded to these defect two-level systems that, that, that kind of diffuse in and out of the frequency landscape, and I'll show you an example towards the end of my talk. Uh, there isn't a really well-understood time scale for those. So the best that we can do so far is we just, we just repeat the learning every few hours, and, and you know, that we, we, we hope for the best, essentially. <laughs> but, but, but there will be progress on this question. This is, this is a very important thread of, of trying to make these systems more, more stable. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that you only look at local correlated errors. <clears throat> That's spatially local, right? But I mean, if you have two qubits that are close in frequency, do, do you expect to see any correlated errors there? Or? You, you, you could, you could, exactly. That, 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 That's not in your model, or? That, that's, that, that's not in the model we used for this. But in principle, you can add all of those. And, and Evout might, might, might discuss you know, examples of how you can go beyond the, the two local approximation. But yes, like, you know, if, if you had some finite coupling uh, and, and you had these two qubits, which were very 
you know, very close in frequency and you had some finite coupling through all of these links, that could lead to you know, uh, uh, noise that's, that's beyond this two local assumption. But yeah. <clears throat> I think, I think you had another question. My question was just, as you mentioned, that you see that if, if something goes really bad in one qubit, then you see it in your overall error. But you, you have a mapping back. You know in particular which region in your circuit that was happening. So you, you know which qubit was problematic or, um, locally. Um, or you only have a no, no, general no, no. error and... Right, right. So, so, so one could do something like, you know, one qubit randomized benchmarking or a T1 experiment, and, and one could, in principle, know if there's something bad that, that's happening there. Uh, so it, it's not necessarily a kind of check that we do both ways, but then, yeah, like, at least while we were building confidence in the stuff, these were the kind of sanity checks we were trying to do. Okay, because, because a lot of this, this affects, you know, the, 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 the kind of circuits we can run, the areas of the device that work well, that don't work well, things like that. So... Thanks for all the great questions. Um, so this is this is an example, um, you know, of of probabilistic error amplification in in action. Um, I won't go into the details of, of you know what the circuit was. I'll just tell you that this is some single side Z observable. The ideal value is supposed to be one, uh, and and basically on the x axis we're looking at about you know up to two thousand random circuit instances, so two thousand different circuits that we're averaging over. And then the g equals to 1 is the base noise level. Uh, and then we want to, to run the same circuit at this amplified noise level of 1.2. So we sample over a different distribution of circuits. Um, and then you know, uh, after a certain number of circuits, this begins to flatten out. Um, and we take that to be the representative value at, at 1.2. And the same we do for 1.6. And then with these three points, one can do um, linear extrapolation. Um, and, and you know, as I was saying, this doesn't. This is not going to get you uh, necessarily an unbiased uh, uh, expectation value. There can be some bias from the from the ideal. Um, and there's also been some some more work from Simon Benjamin's group proposing um, uh, uh, exponential extrapolation as, as as one way to potentially uh, improve the improve the bias. That was also something we tried, and we 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 saw that 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 provided much better performance. And for a large part of this talk, that's that's what I'll be I'll be I'll be focusing on. Okay, so this is this is typically how the, the machinery works. Okay, so now we wanted some example to try this on. Okay, and um, the example that we chose was this very poorly trotterized time evolution of the 2D transverse field icing model. Um, basically, the kind of data I'm going to be showing you is we're going to be looking at uh, a spin lattice that, that shares the hardware topology, this heavy hex topology. We're going to start in the, the all zero initial state, and then we'll, we'll typically fix the circuit depth and, and measure these expectation values as we sweep some of these model parameters. Okay? Um, and, and, and essentially, um, what, what the circuit is going to amount to is a layer of uh, single qubit Rx rotations associated with the transverse field. And then to implement all of these ZZ interactions, we're going to, to have this trotterized form where uh, all of these, these, these ZZ gates or, or all of these ZZ interactions on links can be reduced to three independent layers, okay? The, the red, the, the, the green, uh, the green and the blue, okay? And then when we apply all of these, each of these layers is going to have an independent noise model associated with it. So we're gonna learn that noise model and then amplify the noise in every, in every layer and, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And, and the reason I was, <coughs> Um, uh, you know, calling this poorly trotterized is because these angles that we're going to have are going to be very large. Um, to, to, to reduce, you know, some, um, some, some circuit depth, we're going to force these ZZ angles to be pi over 2 rotations. Um, uh, the very nice aspect of this choice is uh, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the single qubit rotations are either 0 or pi over 2, this circuit is, is Clifford which means that one can, one can have uh, an exact, exactly verifiable uh, thing to compare with, which is, which is really the most interesting part uh, of this, at least in, 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 in my view, right? <coughs> um, and, and to give you a sense of the kind of progress we made, you know, at least visually in terms of the circuit volumes, that the 2017 circuits were just four qubits, depth two. You know, in 2023, we're looking at now 
uh, you know, 127 qubits, circuit depth of 60, way more two qubit gates. This is, this is one very easy visual of the kind of progress that's, that's enabled experiments at this scale, right? This is at a circuit volume that's beyond what one can do in general with brute force classical computation. So one, you know, first, the first thing is going to be to try and build some confidence into, you know, into the device, into the methods. So we're gonna heavily rely on these, these, these Clifford circuits where we can verify the answer exactly and we know, um, you know what, 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 what the experiment should ideally produce. So we're gonna start by looking at the, the global magnetization um, at some, you know, after some fixed uh, depth, which is five trotter steps. Uh, and, and we're gonna sweep this transverse field. Uh, so that's gonna, you know, basically mean a sweep of the Rx angle. Um, for the global magnetization at this, at this angle of zero, we expect the ideal to be one. If we ran, if you looked at the bare noisy experiment in green, you know, you have some bias with exponential extrapolation, we do a little better. You know, things are, that there, there is some bias, but you know, uh, we can discuss that a little later. Um, and then the, the pi over two point is a little more interesting um, because you're, you're actually increasing the, the, the amount of entanglement in the circuit as you go towards this, this Clifford point. Um, the, the ideal answer should be zero there. And the experiment's also able to do a to, 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 to do a pretty good job of, of, of verifying that. Okay, so, so this was the first sanity check, and then um, we can now begin to tweak that that the theta parameter and explore the parameter space between zero and pi over two. And now we are accessing this non-Clifford regime where one might not have access to the the exact uh, uh, evolution. And this is basically what the data looks like. The green is the unmitigated. You run it at these, these, these amplification factors, you try and extrapolate back, and you get this boosted uh, blue trace, okay? And this was basically when we approached, uh, you know, uh, Mike Zellertal's group at Berkeley uh, to try and help us understand if, you know, was the experiment uh, doing anything, uh, anything reliable or were these completely wrong? Um, <clears throat> and, and basically, they, they tried to address this with, with tensor network methods. Uh, and and if, if there, are, there are people who are not uh, uh, familiar with, with, with how these typically work, uh, you know, they, they, these are approximate classical methods where you have some approximation parameter referred to as the, the, the bond dimension. Um, and and you're, you're basically working between, between two extremes. Um, at uh, a bond dimension of, of one, you have, you're approximating this, this wave function to be you know, just a product state. Uh, and then if you had exponentially large bond dimension, you would have an exact representation of, of the state. Uh, and basically how, how far you go between these two extremes is going to be dependent on um, uh, you know, your, your, your classical resources. How much, how much runtime do you have? How much memory do you have? So on and so forth, right? Um, so this was something that, 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 that was tried. Uh, and, and basically, you see this very nice agreement um, at the start of the decay, uh, and then you, you began to see these very large deviations uh, as you approach these 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 larger uh, these larger angles as you increase the degree of entanglement in the circuit. And and the question was, well, which of these is actually correct? We didn't at that point have access to the exact evolution. Um, the nice thing that was then pointed out was, well, we're just looking at local observables, uh, and uh, uh, and, and the circuit depth is also fairly short. So in this limit of, of short depth, looking at local observables, if you try and look at what's, what's called a light cone, you can ask what are actually the qubits in the circuit that, that influence, uh, uh, the influence the observable of, of interest. And so you'll have different light cones for each of the single sites. Uh, and, and then for this depth, uh, the, the number of qubits in that light cone becomes quite manageable, okay? Um, and because of that, it, it, I think it was on the order of maybe like 20 to 30 qubits or something. Uh, but because that's the scale of the light cone, you can then do an exact diagonalization and then and have access to what the exact trace is. And when we did that, you know, uh, the exact trace, you know, really uh, 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 was, was in very nice agreement with the experiment, rather vice versa. The experiment was in very nice agreement with, uh, with the exact trace. So this, this built a lot of confidence for us in that the, the methods and the device were doing quite nice. Um, I mentioned that the pi over two point was, was interesting because there was a more degree of entanglement there and there was very good agreement. Something that you know, one of you in the audience could then question uh, would be to say, well, if you had a completely mixed state 
and you were trying to measure a local z, that would also be zero, right? So it could just be that your system completely decohered, and, and, and now you're claiming that uh, your error mitigation methods are working spectacularly well, right? Um, and, and so basically, you know, to, to kind of satisfy our own <laughs> curiosity there, we decided to go to more complex observables. This is now a weight 10 observable, which is at the Clifford point actually a stabilizer of the circuit. So you know that the expectation value for this observable was supposed to be plus one. Okay, so this is, this is something non-trivial. And, and now for that observable, we wanted to test the performance of the entire uh, uh, experiment again. Um, and there, once again, here is, here is the, the, uh, the noisy expectation value, uh, which we can extrapolate back, you know, kind of loosely, is, is in the right ballpark. Uh, once again, even though the, the weight of the observable is, is, uh, uh, is larger, at the short depth, the, the light cone only involves about 37 qubits. So we still had access to what the exact evolution was supposed to be. Even there, we had a fairly good agreement, which was, which was great to see. Um, yeah, please. So uh, can you just go back one slide about this light cone? I guess I don't understand this, this uh, plot. Ah. So, yeah. so, so basically, um, <coughs> <clears throat> yeah, so, so basically, as you, this, this is basically representative of the circuit, and there is a single side Z observable that I want to measure there. And starting from that single side Z, I can trace back all the two qubit links towards the, to, 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 towards the start of the circuit, okay? And then, like, just, you can consider this to be like a geometric light cone, basically encompassing the area associated with, 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 with those links that, that lead up from the end of the circuit towards the start, okay? Okay, okay, and so, yeah, I guess I would have expected the other kind of, but you're, okay, you're going backwards. Sure, you're, yeah. I see, okay. Right, right, and, and, and basically, if, if the depth was much larger, then, then this light cone would increase, you know, further, and, and, and that'll get more challenging, but because, uh, alternatively, if, if I had a very large weight operator here, uh, then once again, you're starting out from a very large number of qubits, so this will only grow even further, uh, but, but basically, because this was a short depth circuit, the, the weights of the observables were, were small. One could, um, one could access the exact evolution here. I mean, of course, that's not the regime you want to work in, right? Eventually, no. I mean, then you could just you, you use a smaller quantum computer. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But, but basically, this is the, 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 the thing to, to keep in mind is as the quantum computer gets increasingly better, you're going to be able to access larger circuit volumes. You're going to be able to measure higher weight observables, and all of this will get more, more challenging to do. So I guess how does this low weight observable, uh, I guess, correspond to what you were saying earlier about measuring a global observable, and you sort of have maybe a cancellation of errors that make it okay. So I guess yeah, what's this sort of single observable picture that's like you know good, but then the global observable picture that's also kind of good. Yeah. So so <clears throat> so, so basically, depending on the, the extent of the light cone you're going to be increasingly sensitive to, to more and more errors, right? And, and you can kind of begin to see that already here. Uh, well, let me, let me just go, go one more animation through. But you'll basically see that as, as the weight of the observable increases at this fixed depth, you'll see the raw signal drop further. And that's kind of indicative of how, how like, you have more errors that are affecting the accuracy of every observable, right? OK. So there was one question on, on how representative, how do you know if the noise is representative or not, okay? So, so one more really neat thing one could do is, because this is a Clifford circuit at the pi over two point, and because you have access to a poly noise channel, you can do an efficient classical simulation of your noisy experiment at that point and, and predict what the noisy expectation value should have been. And that's basically what you see in, 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 in purple here, right? And the experimental, the, the raw data, the, the, the green point, actually shows very good agreement with that. And that, that builds a lot of confidence, but also going forward, and this can really be an immediate indication of you know, trying to run an expensive quantum experiment to kind of get a sense of how much signal do we have and how much sampling cost one, you know, would one need to kind of extrapolate to the ideal answer even, you know, even before running anything on hardware. Okay, so this is, this is one more way of building confidence. Um, and then we went to an even higher weight observable. This is a weight 17 observable. Once again, a stabilizer with the pi over two point. The light cone's even larger, but there were some more tricks that Sajant, the grad student in Mike's group, came up with to, to try and access the exact. And even here, 
uh, you know, th there is this reasonably good agreement with the exact trace. Uh, the raw signal gets, gets, gets smaller. Um, consequently, the, the error bars on the extrapolations get larger. Um, uh, but, but yeah, but basically for these, for these increasingly complicated examples, we were, we were basically able to show that with a noisy quantum processor, you know, one can produce um, accurate expectation values that are at a, at a scale beyond brute force simulation. Please. Can you say anything about the uh, MPS solution? Because it's, I find it interesting that it, especially for this one um, point, the pi over two point that you have, <coughs> just drops and the solution becomes, seems to be exactly zero. Yeah. Um, and, and then the last plot, that it was also very interesting, like it was kind of zero and had some very interesting behavior yeah. just before that point. <coughs> Do you know anything why, why this happened? Yeah, I mean, so, so the, 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 simple, the, the simple way of understanding this is, is, is your bond dimension is insufficient to represent your, your, your state well enough, right? So in principle, if you threw more, more classical resources, if you had more memory, if you had more runtime, you could, you could, you could increase that bond dimension. But at this bond dimension, which, which led to you know, uh, runs over a, a couple of days on, on Berkeley supercomputers, uh, these, were, these were pretty terrible. Uh, but essentially, what's happening as you go from zero to pi over two is you're increasing the degree of, of entanglement um, in the circuit, right? And, and then at fixed bond dimension, you have a poorer approximation to, to, this, to the state, okay? But, but yes. as we'll have 10 minutes? No, uh, no nine. Nine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're, you're getting questions all through, so, yes. so if sure. you want to just continue. Yeah. Okay. But, but there's been a lot of progress on the classical simulation. I'll, I'll, I'll show you. MPS is not the only thing one can do. Um, Right, okay, and, and so basically this is really the argument for why we think that you know, we're running non-trivial circuits at a scale where one doesn't have access to the exact, you know, uh, one might not in general have access to the exact answer, um, and, and we're still able to produce accurate expectation values. This is basically the evidence um, for the utility that we're arguing, and, and once we had this experiment down, we wanted to push even further beyond what we had for exact verification. So, so one example here was, trying to now increase the circuit depth to a depth of 60. Uh, and then we're looking at one of these single site magnetizations here. Um, and, and, and basically, uh, here we, we saw this, once again, this, this, this big disagreement between, between the MPS and the experimental data points. And uh, this was beyond exact verification at that point. We didn't, we didn't quite know which one was, you know, which one should we trust. We're making all of these statements about accuracy and reliable expectation values, but you know, the, the, the natural question was because we went up to uh, a circuit depth of 60, uh, you know, was it simply that we were, we were decaying much faster uh, and, and that's why there was this deviation or was it, was it actually that the MPS was, was doing a poor job here, okay? Um, and then since, so this, this was basically the, the extent of the, the first paper, and then there was a flurry of, of, of classical simulation work that came out. This was from the flat iron group, uh, which quickly tried to simulate uh, the experiment. Uh, you know, once again, uh, it, it actually did a, a closer job to the experiment than the original MPS. Uh, uh, interestingly, there were some deviations here which were beyond error bars. You know, the natural question for us was, was the flat iron result correct or was our experiment? Uh, right, there were, there were other examples from Garner Chan's group, from, from Google, um, and then we also had our own follow-up work uh, in looking at MPS extrapolation. You know, one can ask, well, you're, the, the, the same way you're, you're amplifying noise in the, in the quantum experiment, perhaps you can, you can scale some, some parameter in the classical simulation and then extrapolate um, there as well. It's not quite as trivial as it sounds. <clears throat> there are complexities there. You know, there are regions where, where things break down even there. Um, but <coughs> instead of looking at MPS, we looked at uh, uh, the, the operator evolution instead. That, that, that seemed to perform better. Uh, but basically, if you, a lot of these initial experiments, if you plotted them on, on, on just one plot, right, you, you'll begin to see that there's this to, you know, about 20% deviation between all of these classical methods. Right? And this is really the challenge of trying to operate at the scale when you don't have access to an exact answer. Uh, you are in this business of approximate solutions. You're going to have approximate classical methods. You're going to have a noisy quantum computer that will produce something, an approximate result as, as well. And basically, this built a lot more confidence you know, for me in the experiment that, that, that even at this larger depth, 
these, these DNA error bars lied within this uncertainty, right? And, and, and one didn't know what the, what the actual um, exact result was uh, for this particular circuit. Um, since then, there's been even more work. Uh, there was, there's been recent work from Garnet Chan's group, which, which claims that this trace is, is accurate to about 0.01. Uh, and even there, the experiment you know, seems, to, seems to perform quite well. Uh, but essentially, what we're seeing is there's going to be this, this back and forth. The experiment will push classical simulation. The classical simulation will motivate us to run you know, more interesting experiments, will more interesting circuits. And, and really, you know, this, is, this is exactly what we're hoping for, that this kind of back and forth between quantum and classical will tell us where the challenging circuits are. Right? The, 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 the motivation for this first experiment really was, was are these methods working at this scale? Um, and, and already we're, we're seeing efforts in this. You know, since that experiment, um, we're seeing a different, different scale of the kind of things people are, are running on these devices internally as well as externally uh, with, with external tools. You know, there are a number of 100 qubit plus experiments uh, uh, already in the last few months, and I'm, I'm very confident this number is going to blow up over the next one year. Right? Um, so people are going to think very hard about what kind of circuits can we run, uh, uh, what kind of interesting problems can we address on these devices with these tools. Uh, you know, uh, along the way, our hardware is also improving. Uh, you know, the, the 127 qubit device is already the state of the art, but if I, if I compare to, to, um, to, to, to best case metrics internally even, which are state of the art for the field as well, there's an order of magnitude improvement that's, that's waiting to be tapped into. Our best two qubit gates are you know, at the 99.9% at the .9 level. The median you know, error rates on the device that we used were closer to 99%. So there's an order of magnitude in gate fidelity there. Um, you know, similarly, even for coherence times, um, the, the median T1s here were about 300 microseconds. The best T1s we've had you know, for transmon qubits has been 4 milliseconds. Um, so there's a lot of this that's going to, to, to feed into the kind of circuit volumes we can access, the kind of observables we can measure. Um, you know, I, I, I did mention that one challenge with superconducting qubits is this business of these resonant defects. Uh, you can basically look and think of this as a, as, a, as a map of how T1 is fluctuating over time you know, as a function of the, the frequency landscape around the qubits. And basically, these things are you know, things that affect you know, the gate fidelity as well, the non-uniformity you know, across the device, the device throughput, the, the stability of the noise model. Uh, and and trying, to, trying to fix this is going to be an important aspect. So with future generations, you know, we are experimenting with with different knobs to, 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 to modulate this TLS qubit interaction. Uh, and, and really with that, we can see that we can, we can push a lot of these error tails down further, uh, you know, which, which can, you know, in principle, span an order of magnitude if, if you were strongly interacting with the defect. Um, we're also looking at uh, you know, moving from the, the, the fixed coupling architecture towards, towards tunable couplers. This, is, this allows for, for, for better throughput, but has also improved like metrics like quantum volume. And this is really you know, just very preliminary data uh, on, on a 133 qubit device, but you can already see with this move to the architecture you know, how much the error rates have dropped. You know, the crosstalks reduced as you go from isolated to simultaneous performance. Uh, 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 and, and you can see that you know, with these tunable couplers, uh, the, the, the difference between those two modes of operation is much smaller. You still have these kinds of large tails, once again, which are typically associated with these, with these TLS effects, but then we are going to have a, a next version um, you know, where we will have that kind of mitigation also incorporated in the device. So you know, people are thinking about new circuits. The hardware is improving as well. You know, uh, all of this is going to feed towards more interesting experiments. <clears throat> there are also more interesting things one can do with error mitigation. Uh, and I'm going to wrap up in just a minute. Uh, uh, you know, in, instead of trying to, to amplify the noise, you can try and um, cancel the noise. Uh, and this is going to happen typically at, you know, with some exponential sampling cost. Uh, you know, this, this gamma bar is basically going to be associated with, with some noise uh, you know, property of the device. Uh, but the game basically is as, as this, this, this noise reduces, as this gamma bar gets closer and closer to one, this sampling overhead becomes increasingly manageable. Um, and, and here is basically an example of a you know, pretty vanishing signal that you can reconstruct. Uh, this is an example of just a, a 50 qubit experiment with the circuit depth of two. But, but basically, this, this goes on to show how like, you, can, you can really mitigate on even 
even weight 49 observables in principle. Uh, and and, 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 and you know, being able to recover this kind of signal, you know, it, it, it amazes me a bit. Um, we've also very recently extended this to, to circuits with, 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 uh, uh, with mid-circuit measurements and dynamic circuits. There's a lot of interest in what one can do with these kinds of circuits. Uh, you know, uh, aspects of the topology become more relevant here. There's a more detailed discussion in the paper where one might have to go beyond just the, the lattice topology uh, to, to have a representative noise model. Um, so yeah, things are also cooking, you know, moving our error mitigation capabilities forward. Uh, but really, yeah, I think uh, uh, we, we have uh, essentially a very powerful tool. And uh, I'll be around this week. And I'd, I'd love to have you know, suggestions and thoughts on, on what you would like to see run on this. Uh, thanks for your attention.